So as you have probably realized, um, accessibility is is an interesting topic, at least to some people like me um, and Jens and a few others. Um, and I'll yeah, I'll just try to give an overview of what what this actually means in the world of PDF, and maybe also elsewhere. <clears throat> This presentation is going to cover five parts. Why, why would you want to even think about accessible PDF? Uh, how does it work? Um, a little piece of history, how it all began, where do we stand today, and what might be next? So why accessible PDF? Uh, hang on, there's one slide missing. <laughs> uh, I added one slide last night and I forgot to create a, another PDF file. Here it is. Yeah. So, <clears throat> usually when we think about uh, people who need accessible technology, accessible documents, content, accessible tools, we tend to think of uh, blind people. Probably because it's easy to understand what their situation is, because if you just close your eyes, we are in the same situation. Of course, we can take away our hands, they cannot. Uh, but it's it's kind of easy to begin to understand what the impact is of not not having any vision. Um, like for for construction, the typical disabled person is the person in the wheelchair. It's kind of the prototype pr prototypical disabled person, and <clears throat> you can easily think about what the what the needs are. But you may forget other types of disabilities. And just to draw your attention to the distribution of. Um, of, of the population, how many people are disabled in, in which regard or which direction. I, I just uh, put a, a table here that I just got uh, recently. It's about pupils in, in Berlin. I think it's representative. So it, it, the situation will be very similar in other countries or other cities and, and, and so on. The pupils in Berlin, um, and as of 2011, 2012, we had roughly 325,000 pupil, pupils in Berlin. And the percentage of disabled pupils is about 6% of that. Um, and this table lists the types of disability that these uh, pupils have to cope with. Um, if you look at blind, like children or youngsters who are completely blind, it's like 92 people as of it's a, the statistics is from, from this year, 2012, 2014, um, <clears throat> which is about 0.2. 46% of all disabled pupils. So it's uh, the smallest group. Um, if you look at the related uh, situation like low vision, like you have limited vision, you just see a little bit, very little actually, um, and it's already 300 pupils, amounting to roughly 1.5%. With hard of hearing and deaf, somewhere in the same range, a few more. But if you look at some of the other disabilities, the numbers are much higher. So you have body or motoric development uh, that is kind of uh, slowed down or limited in, in some way. Uh, you have language, um, so just plain language problems. But they have, so I, 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 want, I want to be honest, I don't have all the details behind the statistics. I could read them, but I still have to read the, the report. Um, um, but um, it could be slow, uh, slow cognitive development, so language understanding is, is not what it should be. Um, it might be that there are immigrants, so people from other cultures who just don't speak German well enough yet. Um, learning, that would uh, include stuff like dyslexia, uh, where you have difficulty reading. It's not that you're not intelligent, it's just one specific thing that doesn't work well for you. And there are a couple of other learning disabilities. Uh, mental development, which is like, yeah, you are somehow slowed down in your, in your overall mental development. Uh, emotional and social development, autism, uh, or also long-term or chronic diseases, which is very, very separate. Um, and if you look at, at, at the distribution, you see that uh, there's lots of other disabilities that somebody may have to cope with. Um, and that there's uh, many more cases of visibility in the field of learning or language or mental development in comparison to other disabilities. 
This is not to say that we shouldn't be thinking about blind people anymore. It's just to put a few things straight and then put them into perspective. Um, and this is also very interesting because in school you learn. Um, if you don't learn a lot, your life may not be as fulfilling and useful as it could be. So it's even more important at that time of, of, a, of, a, of a human being to take care of disabilities and compensate these disabilities in one way or another uh, so they can make the best use of their other capabilities. And I think dyslexia is a very good example. It's, it's a very specific disability. So it's just printed text, like text on paper that is difficult to understand. A lot of these children and, and youngsters don't have any problems in any other context. So mathematics is fine and creating stuff is fine, speaking language per se is fine, it's just reading text, printed text on, on a page is challenging. And um, to a substantial degree this difficult, difficulties can be overcome, so you can cope with dyslexia and try to learn reading anyway, it's just much harder. Um, and the reason I'm explaining this is that for people with disabilities it's important to get access to content or to documents despite their disabilities. And we all know it can be done, so a blind person can listen to the text being spoken aloud or using a braille display to sense the text with the fingers. Um, Deaf people actually are also an interesting population. So uh, you would say, looking at a PDF document or a printed page, they don't have a problem. They can see. The problem is interesting. Uh, deaf people, most of the time, learn a different language as their first language. So sign language is not just a different mechanism to communicate in the same language. It's its own language. So learning sign language, uh, whether it's German or Polish or whatever, um, doesn't help you with reading printed text. It's just different. And once you want to understand printed text, you have to learn another language. So then you have to learn po printed Polish or printed German or printed English. It's just a different language. It's as different as English is different from French or German from Polish and so on. Um, so sometimes these Audiences need additional support to get access to content anyway, despite the fact that they have no access in, in a certain way or uh, not so good access in, in some other way. And this uh, also applies to PDF documents. If you just have PDF documents without any extra um, mechanisms, it's just visual content on the rectangular area on the screen or printed out on the, on the printer. So just to, to go through this in a kind of exercise, you can read this. <laughs> uh, so this might be a typical situation for a low vision person. So a person who still can see a little bit can recognize shapes. If, it, if, it, if the person goes close enough, it may recognize characters and you can actually read. But uh, in an average situation, that, that may look like this. This could be from a PDF informing somebody about some important um, facts. And I do, usually do this as a mental exercise. So I say, well, we have this, it's a PDF in front of us on the screen. Let's try to capture it. And then use some other mechanism, let's say, enlarging it in some way or speak out loud using a text to speech feature and so on. So we capture that, we select this, copy it. We paste it and we get this in the text editor. We were very unlucky because the whole thing was just an image. And an image pasted into a plain text editor doesn't give you anything. So it was not very useful. It could be better at sometimes. So we select the thing again, it's not an image, it's something else. Copy, paste into a text editor, and we get this. To whom does this feel somehow familiar? So occasionally we have that as well. We have a PDF file, we select text, so we want to use the text in our word processor, paste it, and it's just spam the um, 
obviously this is a case where there, there is text in the document, but the encoding of the text is useless in terms of semantics. So we characters are being used, but the, the, the matching to, to a Unicode characters is just not existing. Of course, you could be more lucky. It's not always that bad. So we do our thing again, copy, paste, and we get this. So Unicode is all okay. We get the right characters. Uh, if we have enough time and enough motivation, we may read this anyway. Uh, but it's, it's not very funny. So all the white space is missing. So between the words, there's no white space. We don't need white space on a PDF. Nobody sees white space, huh? So, in some cases, PDFs get created where they just skip the white space. They just put a distance between two characters, but they don't put actually white space. Um, there's no other things like uh, new lines and arrangement of the text in, in a semantic uh, fashion. It, it, it's okay. You can read it, but it's not very efficient. So, again, uh, Next round of this little exercise, uh, we copy again, we paste again, and we get this. It's getting better. Um, so we do have white space between the words. It makes reading so much easier, I think. Uh, we have some arrangements of concepts like new lines and so are reflected in, in the pasted text. Um, I would say for short text, like it's typical for many email exchanges, it's, it's okay. Uh, you wouldn't want to read a novel like that, or a technical book, or whatever, or a magazine. Uh, it's just text, 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 text. So it could be better. Same exercise, next round. Uh, copy, and then paste again. And now, some of the text looks different than other text. It's, of course, only visually reflecting that some of the text might be a headline or a heading, and other text might just be normal paragraph text, or in this case, it's a list. It's also pretty recognizable as a list. And especially if you have more text, then it becomes much easier to, to figure out the structure of the text and find out what's going on. And this is also the same kind of information somebody would need who needs additional access to the content beyond just looking at the content uh, on the page on the screen. Just as an example, a person with motoric disabilities who might be able to, to move a joystick but not much more with, with a lot of control needs uh, some mechanisms to navigate in a longer document. And instead of just going through it at a, at a fixed speed and wait until you come to the place in the document that's of interest to you, it should be possible to maybe not just jump page by page but jump heading by heading. So you say just jump to the next heading, heading level one or heading level two, so I can more quickly find uh, what I'm interested in. Another use case is that you just enlarge it uh, drastically. So this is the same text again, and it's catering to people with low vision. Some people do that. If they don't like this, this is Sometimes steal this if you're careful. In some audiences, some people have to, like a magnifying glass, and they look at the slide and, 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 and the projection area. And it's, it's helping them to still read some of it. And then you can guide the user to the text. So the, of course, I can at any time just do this game and then move around on, on, on the screen. Yeah. So both Mac and Windows today can, can do this as a built-in feature. But in longer text, it becomes cumbersome to find your lines, and there's the next line you get lost in the page. So it would be good if, if a tool could guide you through the content in the proper sequence. This is especially true if you have a multi column layout, which is typical in a magazine or newspaper. If you had to move around using a screen magnification that's built into the operating system, you would get lost at some point. At least if it's three columns or an even more complex page. So with guided reading, you can even be guided through this three column arrangement.
So that's kind of the goal. You have content that normally in the, in the world of PDF is just communicated on a visual level. And you want to make it easier for certain people to access the content in some other way. Reading out loud, enlarging on the screen, uh, navigating more easily, not jumping from chapter to chapter, but jumping from heading to heading and so on. So how does this actually work, technically speaking? So there's something called tags. And tags are injected into the normal PDF. So you have the normal PDF with the visual content. You just put tag there. Small things that connect the visual content to the tree structure, the logical tree structure. So for example, for let's say the top line on the slide is my heading for this slide. I put a tag around this. I qualify the tag, so I say this is a heading, it's on a normal paragraph, and I connect it to a tree structure. And by means of doing so, I create a logical reading model. Because I can just walk the logical tree and I go from item to item to item um, and find the content. No, it's, it's separate. Um, so bookmarks, what you have in Acrobat, for example, the bookmarks where you can just have um, an index of, of several places in the document. That is just, the bookmarks are just pointing to an area on the page. So they are not really connected to the page. They're still useful. So it's an additional mechanism to help people navigate through the document. So it's not bad. You can derive the bookmarks from the page. Okay. Yeah. Some do it manually anyway because they can. So, for example, some headings are very long. If you have a very long heading in the bookmark section, it's yeah. not so nice. So some some people create a menu, create a short version of the heading entry for the bookmark and, and things like that. Yeah, I don't know what I'm No, no. So anyway, the, the, this tree structure is like a nervous system in the PDF. So it's not just dead meat and bones anymore. It's some nerves that make it live. <clears throat> and uh, the previous time I gave this presentation, I had a detailed uh, um, overview of the tags and how they work. Uh, I'm not doing this here. Uh, if you really want to get a feeling um, about this, there's, there's a tags panel in Acrobat. And if you grab a tag PDF file, you can find out how the tag structure connects to the content. So, it's just a PDF. How, how did it begin? Um, there was a general trend in the late 90s to start thinking about accessibility in IT. Um, it all goes back to, to movements in the United States. Um, and culminated in, in, a, in Section 508, which is a part of the American Disability Laws. Um, and it defines a number of guiding principles and rules, what you should do when providing IT to accommodate the needs of people with disabilities. So it established the principle that disabled people should have the same quality of access to important content and documents as non-disabled people. Uh, the U.S. disability laws so far apply to a government, starting with the federal government and possibly going up to state government and then in lower levels of government. Um, and the Section 508 was relatively generic. And in 1999, the W3C came up with web content accessibility guidelines, which built on top of these uh, Section 508 con uh, concepts and kind of more specifically describe what you should do with web content to make it accessible. Um, so this was happening more or less on the website, uh, HTML, websites, internet, but also already intranet. And in 2001, Adobe came up with a concept called Tag PDF <clears throat> that introduced the possibility to do, achieve similar things in a PDF as the things you can do in HTML. In HTML, you have tags anyway. They're part of the language. Uh, 
So you have your heading one, and you have your paragraph, and your list and tables, and so on. And Tag PDF introduced almost the same content into PDF. So you can have headings and paragraphs and tables and lists. But not identical, but very similar to how you do things in HTML. The first tool that actually uh, created such tag PDF was Adobe FrameMaker in 2002. Not a big surprise because FrameMaker is a structured publishing uh, instrument. It's much more structured than Indusign or Black Express or something like that. It's more like Word in a way. And to translate the internal structured document in, in the FrameMaker format into yet another structured representation in the form of tag PDF probably was much easier than taking InDesign or something like that for the first thing. Microsoft followed in, in 2007, offering tag PDF exports as, as part of the product. And at that time, I think there was Microsoft Office, uh, Microsoft Word, Microsoft Excel, PowerPoint, and then later on Publisher, and even one or two others who had it. And from my point of view, th this is a kind of surprise because, especially at that time, Microsoft was not necessarily a promoter of PDF. They were even thinking about pushing XPS somewhere, their new uh, internal uh, printing architecture language. Um, but I think they just realized that uh, already at that time, like six years ago, that PDF is so widely used as an exchange format, especially for the final form of a document, that it's probably a good idea to support it in Microsoft Office, even though they're not, not such a big friend of PDF at that time. Today in, my, in Windows 8, you have some PDF display capabilities built into the operating system, so it's becoming even stronger. Open Office followed in 2008 and also started offering uh, tag PDF export. Um, in all cases, whether you look at FrameMaker or Office or Open Office, um, it should be said that it's not fully automatic. You have to uh, construct the offering document in the proper fashion to get it well tag PDF. In 2008, uh, the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with, persons with Disabilities uh, came into effect. It was already published in 2006. Uh, quite a number of countries have subscribed to the uh, UN Convention. Um, some say it's a tiger without teeth. So it's a, it's, it's a nice, nice, thing, nice thing you can subscribe to or not will make a big difference. There's one mechanism in the UN Convention um, that every three years you have to report. You have to publish a report for your country uh, what you have done to achieve the goals uh, written down in the UN Convention. And I think that's probably the most useful mechanism of the UN Convention. Unfortunately, Germany so far didn't do a very good job, but I hope uh, we'll be becoming better things in the future. In 2008, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines were revised and published as a second uh, version. Um, part of the changes in, in the second version are due to the te technological developments. So in 1999, there was not really much flash, if anything, at all on websites. When did flash start? Does anybody know? Oh, yeah. Okay, but it was not common yet on websites. Um, so be because Flash became more prominent and some other te techniques, uh, JavaScript became much more relevant and so on, it was necessary to revisit some of the rules of, of WCAG and, and just uh, adjust them <coughs> to change reality. Um, Last year, in July 2012, uh, PDF was published. That is an ISO standard based on, uh, on PDF. It kind of picked up all the concepts from, from WCAG and applied them to, to the world of PDF. So as of summer last year, we have an ISO standard for PDF that describes how to construct an accessible PDF file following the same concepts as WCAG. Um, and offering um, much needed um, 
um, orientation in, in this field. So before it was in principle already possible to create tag PDF, and, and the recap actually says a few things about PDF, but um, it was never specific enough, complete enough to be really uh, helpful and and help people to actually get there. Um, one of the first consequences of this uh, PDF UI standard is that we relatively soon, hopefully, going to have a tool that validates a different PDF file against the PDF UI standard. It's, of course, very important. If you have a standard, you must be able to find out whether you're complying with the standard. Um, it's, it's PAC 2.0, or PDF Accessibility Checker version 2.0. Um, to be honest, I was hoping to be able to present it here already. Uh, it's been slightly delayed, as sometimes happens with software. Uh, currently, uh, the expectation is it will be published in the second quarter this year, which is where to be soon. Um, and it will be free of charge, in the same way as the current version, uh, Pack 1.3, it's free of charge. It will be a free download. Uh, the development actually goes back to a sponsoring campaign um, driven by the PDF Association. Uh, we asked the guys who have developed Pack 1.3 how much money they need to develop a PDF UA version of PDF Accessibility Checker. And they asked for 26,000 francs, and then we collected 26,000 francs, and now they are doing it. Um, having PDF UA files or accessible PDF files, and, and maybe even a validation tool is not all you need. You also need software that actually takes advantage of the features in the PDF UA file. Because it's always difficult uh, to push commercial companies and tell them what to do. Um, again, in the PDF session, we thought we should maybe talk to somebody who is more willing to discuss certain ideas. Uh, and this is NVDA, the Non-Visual Desktop Access Screen Reader, developed by two blind programmers in Australia. And we got in touch with them and told them, well, we, we would like NVDA to be a fully PDF UI conforming screen reader, so that it takes advantage of all the nice features in PDF UI files. And uh, we would also be willing to send some money to Australia, so to make it interesting for you to do this. They, NVDA is fully based on sponsoring. It's, it's really just being based, it's based on, on donations, both by, by users, by, by non-profit organizations, but also companies like Mozilla and Adobe have kept um, supporting NVDA. And it's obvious that whenever they can get money to, to help with the development, they're willing to also talk about details of exactly what to implement. And they have done something already, so the table features, which is always the more complex part of the implementation, have been much enhanced and seem to be fully compliant with PDF UA now, and there's other features that are being developed now in the next month. So that over time, hopefully late this year, we can say that NVDA is a fully conforming PDF UA uh, tool. Relevant for the European Union is uh, a EU mandate. Uh, that has been developed in the last few years. The, the preparation work has just finished, uh, end of last year. Um, and the EU mandate is about uh, procurement for the public sector, uh, procurement of IT. Um, in a nutshell, uh, the rule is if you procure IT, it must be accessible and must follow a certain set of guidelines. This implies hardware in software. So if you if you have purchase as a, as a, in the public sector, uh, something like a machine where you can pay certain fees and it must be accessible to a person in a wheelchair and things like that, to a blind person and so on. But of course, it also applies to software and, and systems and documents and so on. And this EU mandate is now undergoing the last phase of improvement by the national standardization bodies. Uh, this should complete within about a year, probably end of 2013 or early 2013. And once it's approved, it becomes a law in the European Union. So by 2014, there will be a law based on this euro norm that requires that the public sector agencies uh, follow this law. And there will be 
a grace period of about two years, so by 2016 you really must comply with the rules. Hmm? I think it was planned to have it uh, published beginning of 2014, end of 2015. So roughly two years as far as I know. And um, the good thing is it's not a national law because we already have some national laws in Germany, Switzerland, France, Denmark, whatever. They're all slightly different, and sometimes they are enforced, and sometimes they are not enforced. I expect because this is about uh, procurement, um, we usually have a public tender, and then you can apply for the contract. And if you get the contract, and I don't, and my offering is accessible, and your offering is not accessible, I will go to court. And I will tell them there's a law that uh, procurement must purchase accessible systems for solutions. And you got the deal despite the fact that you are not accessible, and I am accessible. And there's some likelihood that I would win. It's nothing personal against you. <laughs> so, but I, I believe it's a mechanism where, where the tiger finally has some teeth. Because so far, there, there's no accessibility police that comes along and says, Your government agency is not publishing accessibility there. You will go to prison. It's not happening. But if you have the commercial interests involved of suppliers of the, of, of, of the public sector, and, and I want to win the country, you want to win the country, I'm accessible, you are not, it will create the right uh, dynamics, because you will also be accessible enough to, to win the country. So I hope this is going to change the whole situation a little bit, because at the moment things are moving relatively slowly. And it does impact documents. It's not just about web servers or internal workflow systems. It's also about documents because documents are an integral part of of just about everything. This is just highlighting some of the more important steps in the historical development. I essentially just described everything here. Um, so I think you're you're already hearing like. There are some laws, you have to do things. Sometimes it's more on the public sector, and even the public sector it's more on the federal level, and and um, some people do it, and if you don't do it, nothing happens. Uh, occasionally you may get blamed by an association for the rights of the blind or something like that, but... You, you could put it that way as well. There should be, there could be more pressure. Um, you could ask yourself, well, if it's not really happening, why should I deal with it? I mean, you also here for business reasons. So I, I think, at least in the context of PDF, and I'm only speaking about PDF and documents you, you would um, publish or exchange um, as PDF, I'm not talking about websites or, or other aspects, is that because of this PDF UA standard, we have a very clear point of reference. So we, we can say, when, when we talk about accessibility and accessible PDF, we mean PDF UA. Whatever is written down in the standard, that is accessible PDF. It's something that has been lacking before, at least in the field of PDF. There's lots of accessibility experts who tried, and sometimes successful, and sometimes not, tried to create uh, accessible PDF to the best of their knowledge and based on the tools they had. And I can tell you, I don't want to be rude, but 80% of what they created is crap. It's just not good. Um, sometimes it was laziness. Sometimes it was lack of good tools. Uh, I hope you can agree, Jens. Jens is one of the service providers for, for this kind of service. So he creates accessible PDF documents for government agencies or companies. And his PDFs are, are the remaining 25%. <laughs> but they are really good. Pretty good. So there are some service providers who do a good job, but the majority of accessible files that are also being presented as accessible files on, on government websites are just not good. Last week, a blind person, almost blind person, was asking me why it is so often that in a tech PDF there is less information than in a non-tech PDF. Because it's tagged so badly that you can't get to the actual information. Some of the information is hidden because it's not included in the tagging structure. So it can even make things worse. By having PDF UA, you can connect the standard, and hopefully in a few weeks or maybe two months or so, we can use the PDF Accessibility Checker 2.0. Uh, 
which is kind of officially recognized because it's supported by PDF Association and some other organizations. You grab the file, you check it, and you say, yeah, it's good, or you say, no, it's not good. It's much easier. The other thing that's very important is that tools are emerging. So I presented uh, in, in this morning's uh, session about major tag for InDesign, but it's not the only tool. There's Access PDF for Microsoft Word. There's Common Look for, for the Office applications, also for, for, for um, PDF and Acrobat. Um, companies like Adobe are investing a little bit more in this field. So Acrobat Pro 11, which was published um, late in October last year, uh, has much improved tools for checking and for fixing accessibility and so on. So um, there's something happening. And part of the reason it's happening is because of the standard. So this applies to Axayo from made to tag. Uh, let's say two years ago or three years ago, I would not even have bothered thinking about made to tag because I wouldn't have known what to work against. So what is the exact goal? What should I achieve with my tool? I would not have had a clear understanding. Even if I had a clear understanding, I would run the risk that I'm the only one having this kind of understanding because the next person would have a different understanding. So the, the, the market is just too small at that time. Um, and I think it's, it's the same for some other developers. So Access PDF for Word, they have no clear goal, where to go, makes it easier. It makes it easier to talk to people and so on. Now, there's also education. You have to do something to make a tech PDF file, a well tech PDF file. You have to do something in the authoring application. You have to work with style sheets in a smart way. You have to create alternative text for images and other content that is not itself text, and so on. So how do you explain this to users? And I've seen so many explanations in the last few years how to do this that are not compatible with each other, because each expert had their own approach to doing this. Uh, it was very difficult for users to understand what they should be doing. And most of them just decided to do nothing. Of course, also for developers of, of, of document creation tools, I just explained that. It's once you have a clear goal, you can work towards that goal. You should also not forget the developers of assistive technology. Assistive technology are all these small and specialized tools that help a blind person, a low vision person, a hard of hearing person, a person with uh, limited mobility or a dyslexic person to do something with the content anyway. And also in the past it was like, yeah, PDF doesn't work well anyway, and we don't care much, and we don't do much, and... Uh, they were right, there were so few PDF documents where it would be useful to help us. And now, again, you have a clear uh, goal. And last but not least, users of accessible PDF. Sometimes if, when you talk to disabled people, and you try to find out what they are looking for, what they would like to have, they're sometimes too modest. Some blind people say, yeah, if it at least could read the text somehow, they're not even asking for navigation in a long document or, or other things. They, they are because they think it's not possible. So they are, if it only could read it, I, I could convert it to an MP3 file and listen to the MP3 file. Just think of an MP3 file for, for two hours then, and you are just interested in one article. How do you find the article? You have to listen for 90 minutes to get there. So uh, that's also quite, quite good. And on, on the other side, sometimes you, you talk to users or also advocates of accessibility who are asking for too much. Actually, those are the ones I like the least because they make life unnecessary, dif life unnecessary difficult. Um, for my taste, it goes back to, to an attitude that's been around, I don't know, 50, 100 years ago. Oh, the poor blind person so hard for him to, to live his life, we have to do a few things extra. I think it's wrong. It's about equality. Same quality access to the same kind of content. Not better, not worse. So that should be a reasonable goal. If somebody feels like doing something extra, that's fine. But it should not be mandated by standard or other rules. So just to give you an example, there are some advocates who say, well, for every abbreviation you have in the document, you must put the full version of the abbreviation exactly there. And I say, no, it's, it's like for sighted people. 
Usually in a good text, we have an abbreviation. It's explained once at the beginning, and then you know what it is, and then you use it. In our electronic world, uh, if you didn't read the beginning, you start in the middle, you can still search whether you have some information, something in the bottom. So why should I take substantial extra measures for a blind person, or a low vision person, or some other person to, to really put the full text of an abbreviation next to every abbreviation? So the, the PDF UH standard very clearly says we want to have equal quality access to the content. Not less, not more. More is okay, but it's not mandatory. We're also seeing that uh, legislation is moving again. So, uh, as far as I can tell, there have been two, two apps and then downs ago. Late 90s, it was a very uh, active time. So, when WCAG was invented and Section 508 came up in the US, it became very active and then it slowed down again, like it's often the case. And then again, 2008, 2006, 2008, with the publication of WCAG 2, it became very active again, 2009 maybe. And then you slow it down. And also, if you ask to accessibility uh, solution or service providers, business was good in 2008, but it slowed down to a substantial degree uh, later on. Um, and I have the impression it's, it's, it's going up again, based on the EU mandate, based on the UN convention, based on national laws that are being uh, published and so on. Um, and I hope that in this context, we will also have a good opportunity uh, to extend the reach of, of tech PDF and accessible PDF. Now, of course, it's necessary. If, if, there, if, if the market is too small, nobody can make money, and then the market will not be growing. It's only if there's some, some movement, some pressure, um, that some people can actually make money and invest their time and energy to create, create good solutions. Um, this may sound familiar to some people who have been in the session this morning. Um, so what, what's next? What do you have to do? I think the, the first thing is to, to begin to understand where accessible, accessible PDF is happening. Some people, when talking about accessible PDF, only think about, let's say, government documents, very important government documents. Some other people are thinking about publications maybe from, from a publisher or reports or information brochures from, from vendors and so on. Um, some people are thinking about forms, fillable forms that you can have in, in PDF and that you may want to interact with. I think it's important, and, and the, other, the other conception that is associated to that is that there's always a person or department in charge of this. And you can then try to force this department to do things in a better fashion than before. So you go to the publication department of an important federal government agency, and you grab them by their nose, <laughs> and you turn and say, you must do this. And I think it's, it's in a way possible with this kind of organization, or the department in such an organization, but we should not overlook that probably the majority of PDF documents are created by normal people. If you look documents inside organizations or documents being published by organizations, you have a vast amount of publications that in a way are not developed, created, published in a professional manner. There is not a publication department that's grabbing the content and making a very nice document when it's being published. It's just a person, somebody sitting somewhere in, in the operation, putting together relevant content using Microsoft Word or maybe Indesign or something else. At some point somebody says, oh, this is good stuff. Maybe do a final round of review and we just publish it. And so it's everybody. It's me, it's you, and it's you. We are creating, probably creating, with some likelihood, PDF files all the time. So instead of just looking at specialized departments whom we try to force to do comply with certain rules, we have to think of everybody. And we have to start thinking about how can we educate everybody to at least do a better job than before in being able to create tech and accessible PDF files. And what I have ended up doing in the last month and when doing a couple of seminars is that I um, 
focus on these five aspects because these are aspects that you can actually understand. It's not very tricky, it's not very complicated, it's not very technical. It's about having a semantic role for content. Some people just say style sheets uh, and, and so on. Uh, you have to establish an understanding that reading order is important. You have to have, develop an understanding that for content that is not already text, you have to provide a text alternative. It's a nice idea to think about visual contrast once, of, once in a while, and to just make sure you're not getting too fancy in how you lay out your page. And metadata. And a lot of this actually doesn't cause a lot of work. If you think about semantic work, if, you have, if you're actually using style sheets, which is a surprise to some users. Yeah, some some people use, whether they use words or insign doesn't matter. They do everything by hand. I've just received a document last week where the, somebody was asking for help to create a text with their Not a single style in a hundred page document. So might be. Once you understand that style sheets can be useful, and once you identify the role of each style sheet by saying this is heading one, this is a paragraph, and so on, once you start using the right mechanisms for lists and tables, you don't have to do much more. You could um, think about creating templates for people running your organization. So if there's memos and reports and this and that, just once, and only once, create a template for the mem memo and for the report, give it to people and say, just use this, but please also use the style sheet for your format. You don't even have to assign the heading levels to the style sheet because it's already in template. Once you do that, you already gain a lot. And also for the reading order, just don't play around too much. So just make it flow the way it should flow. The bigger challenge is the alternative text for images. It's extra work in most cases. So you have images in a document, somebody has to put some text there. there it's, it's extra work. You have to face that. Contrast, again, is just about doing it slightly differently in some cases. Just think about your visual design before you put together a document. It doesn't cause extra work in itself. It's just about getting things right that maybe are not right all the time. The metadata is like you at least could put a document title in your document as metadata. It would be much appreciated by some. It could be. And there are some mechanisms uh, that could pick up the metadata and then use that for the alternative text, but it's, currently it's not very well developed. Um, admittedly, some of the stuff is well hidden in some applications, so if, if I had to do this in Microsoft Word, I think I could succeed, but I would have to try to find uh, the menus and, and dialogues and this and that again to do all of it. Uh, but with a little bit of, of education, I think, um, things could be improved substantially. And of course, it's always easier if you do it right, right away as opposed to having to fix it later in the day. So Jens does some of his business by fixing PDF files because he doesn't even have the source files anymore. And of course, that's the most challenging approach. You can start with the Word document and at least get your style sheets in order and already put the alternate text there and do a few other things and use the list feature for lists and the table feature for tables and so on. Uh, there's much less fixing necessary downstream. <clears throat> Let's also be clear that by doing just this, it will not be a perfect PDF A file right away, but it will much be much closer than it is today. The, the remaining work that's necessary to make it a 100% PDF A file uh, is much less and much more affordable. For Um, how do you explain to somebody what a certain exotic food tastes like? How do you explain to somebody who has never eaten a certain exotic food what it tastes like? I can care. But the easiest is if you can give him the exotic food and say try it. And this slide is kind of trying to do the same. So in, instead of keeping talking about accessible PDF and this and that, um, 
just get your feet wet. Like, do, do something with tech video. And there's a couple of options you, you could be using um, to get kind of get the hang of it. So you have seen it, how it works, whether it works well, whether it doesn't work well, what's nice, what's not so nice. Um, and one of the, the options is Kalas has published a free of charge tool called uh, Kalas PDF Pro HTML. It takes a tag PDF file, it does not work in files that are not tagged. It takes a tag PDF file and creates an HTML representation with a structured view. So you can find out what, what the structure is doing to the content. Um, you have the PDF accessibility checker that I already mentioned that could uh, show you to which degree a tag PDF file is well tagged. Um, I've seen PDF file, tag PDF files where, for example, just the first page was tagged and the rest was not. And it could be a 100 page document. If you just look at the document and in the, in the PDF metadata it says it's tagged and you open the tag panel, there are some tags, but it's not tagged. Um, using something like, like PAG or PDF Go HTML, you find out how it's tagged, so how much of the content is showing up in which fashion. It's also a good idea to at least, in terms of, of tasting it, try out the screen view. I don't expect you to spend hours and hours and days and days using a screen reader because, yeah, at the moment you don't need it really. But it's still a good exercise to try to do something with it. You could be using um, NVDA, which is unfortunately only available for Windows. Unfortunately for me, some people say it's just a light platform. <clears throat> but you could also be using VoiceOver on Macintosh, which is the built-in accessibility feature for, for macOS and iOS. There's information on the internet how to use it, like a cheat sheet where you can find the most important uh, keyboard shortcuts because it, it's it's challenging at the beginning because it starts babbling and, and talking to you in some way, but it doesn't say what you want to hear. And so, but that in itself is a, is a good good exercise. This is just a view of PDF Go HTML, so it, it converts to take PDF into HTML and have a structured view which is called it tells you this is an image, this is the alternate text for the image, this is a paragraph, this is a list, and these are the list items and so on. So you kind of begin to recognize, once you have seen like three, four, five, six documents in this fashion, you get an, uh, an understanding of how the structure works. Um, if you really want to get going and, and actually do something, and if you if you're using InDesign, uh, make a tag is a relevant option. It's a plugin developed by Axai Software. It's free of charge until end of June, so free of charge to play around with. Of course, later on there will also be trial versions, but it will cost some money starting July. And what it does, it actually turbocharges InDesign CS55 or CS6. So features that already exist inside InDesign that help you work. On your documents, you can create a tag PDF file. It just makes life easier. It makes things faster, easier, more robust, more reliable. It gives visual feedback, where InDesign doesn't give you visual feedback, and so on. <coughs> and it's also, it, it's, it's targeted at productions. It's people who have to do creation of tag PDF uh, documents on a regular basis, they need to be fast and reliable, so that they, have, they can be efficient. And make a tag is, Achieving just that. So this is a screenshot from from Make the Tag and some design, and it does have some color highlighting to reflect the thematic role of, of tags. Uh, it does have a built-in preview. Uh, looks more or less the same as PDF Pro HTML because it's the same technology. So while you're working, you can already have a preview of of the structure. That does bring me to the end of my presentation. I think I hit it more or less on time. First time today, but thank you. Uh, I'm around. If you have questions, let me know. And other than that, you should leave other people around.